California. The name alone conjures up images of sunshine, surfers, beaches, and of course, Hollywood. But further north, the scenery changes drastically. The beaches and sunshine of the south are replaced by lush forests, majestic mountains, and wild rivers. This region with its 15,000 hectares or 37,000 acres of dense forest attracts hikers, hunters, and fishermen from all over the world, eager to explore its natural beauty. One particularly scenic road connecting the towns of Willow Creek and Happy Camp takes travelers through a redwood forest with trees among the tallest on the planet. But tourists coming to Willow Creek, nestled south of the Oregon border, are after more than just the scenery. For centuries, a shadow has stalked the woods here, inciting panic and spreading rumors. You don't see them unless they want you to see them. They're very elusive. They're, some people call them tree peekers. Somewhere between six and eight feet tall and covered in brown or reddish or blackish fur. It was um, dark brown to black hair. It had um, a protruding brow ridge, a pointy cone head. They're very careful. They know the woods a lot better than we do. And they don't want to be seen. The creature has footprints that look like this. It's usually big and bulky. They still do not know what the creature was that had the tracks. That's Indian Creek, and that's where these people were when they saw it scooping up water in its hand. There was something in my yard that was big and heavy and made the ground shake. I don't think it was a bear, and it sure didn't sound like a deer. And all of a sudden, this big shadow with arms and legs and a head walks behind us going that way. He said, my biologist found an elk with its head twisted off. Ran up to my wife and kids and said, let's go, let's go, move. And they're like, you know, what's your problem? I go, now, move. Nestled in the heart of the Six Rivers National Forest, Willow Creek is known as the world capital of Bigfoot. The best place to search for the ape-like monster that walks on two feet and was known by Native Americans as Sasquatch. Willow Creek is probably the most concrete base for Bigfoot. Uh, if you're looking for Bigfoot and if, you're, if you want to find people who have information regarding Bigfoot, Willow Creek is the center of that story, that lore, the, the history of it. We have many people in our community who have seen, heard, felt, smelled, found his dens. Uh, you know, we can you can find a lot of good stories about Bigfoot here in our town. And we have a lot of believers. Well, there's several local, a variety of local legends, and there's a lot of local tradition that goes back quite a long time in uh, the Hoopa Valley, and then north in the Uruk area, and then northeast in the, in the Karuk area. I think the rumors I mean, the, the stories in the local area go back six, 7,000 years with all the local tribes having stories about it. There are lots of Native American stories of lots of different creatures in the woods. And a Bigfoot-type creature is among those. There was a notorious uh, history of a, of a larger, hairier uh, uh, creature that lived in that area. You know, these cultures didn't have an image of an ape back in the early days. Um, the more traditional members of the culture will probably tell you that it's a spirit of some kind, you know, not uh, an animal at all. In their languages, they all had names that reflected uh, physical beings. For instance, the uh, White River Apache have a name for this thing that literally means big, hairy man. The uh, Blackfeet in Montana have a name that means big feet. And they all have different understanding of what, what these are. The, the uh, Diné, Navajo, uh, in the Four Corners area, uh, believe that the more often this being is seen, uh, the closer we are to the end times.
well, people see them around here still to this day. Just ordinary people. But uh, some of these people working up in the area saw the creature at night, you know, when they're driving home from work, just crossing the dirt roads out in the woods. Uh, locals who fish or hunt, um, they see them out in the mountains. Uh, some local people describe seeing them just in their backyards. You know, we don't have fences here. We have your backyard is mountains that go on for miles and miles and miles. In 1958, they were building this road up there into Bluff Creek. It was uh, virgin timber for the most part up in there, and they wanted to do some logging. There was a construction project uh, in the area, then they found really strange footprints, and this finally got out to the coast as a, as a story about Bigfoot. These original tracks, they had a very human-like appearance, you know, um, and th this is where the, the word, uh, the name Bigfoot really was born. They, they were found many different times uh, around the tractors. You know, they'd leave the tractors up there at night and go home down here for the most part. And uh, when they'd come back in the morning, they'd find this. These workers witnessed other disturbing things. Pieces of heavy machinery, some of which weighed hundreds of pounds, were found well into the forest, a trail of mysterious footprints leading up to them. Willow Creek is intimately linked with the Bigfoot legend, as anyone who has visited the town knows. The Bigfoot Books Library is a veritable goldmine of records, eyewitness accounts, and documented evidence. Its owner is happy to talk about the mysterious creature and shed some light on the mystery. There are these mystery primates pretty much everywhere across the world um, through through Central Europe, Asia, Siberia, the Himalayas, up uh, and down the coast of Asia, all through the Indian subcontinent, into Africa, you know, South America. About the only place they're not really legitimately described is out on the islands of Polynesia, but, I mean, out farther like Hawaii, but uh, throughout Indonesia there, there, there are plenty of uh, these mystery apes. I am convinced that there's Bigfoot, and it's not only here. It's absolutely worldwide. When we had, I think it was 2003 symposium, a Russian scientist came from Russia and brought books on their Amesty, which is also a Bigfoot creature. And I met Heath, who was a publisher of a book called the Yowie in Australia. So they have a creature in Australia that's similar to the Bigfoot. Well, you know, there, I don't think there is one missing link, right? Um, we, I think we still are apes. We ha are primates. We are, we are very, very closely related to the chimpanzee. Um, some biologists consider us to be the third chimpanzee, you know. Um, we think we're very special, you know, and different and unique because our civilization has dominated the world, but uh, we are animals and we did evolve naturally. Much of the evidence surrounding Bigfoot's existence is surprising, and not just by the nature of the facts themselves, but by the amazing credibility of their authors. In July of 2000, Dr. Matthew Johnson was hiking with his family in a national park when he was suddenly overcome by the feeling that he was being followed. I was looking down the slope to try to see if I could see what it might be that was, you know, paralleling us. Keep in mind, the slope of the mountain is like this. I'm up here. My family's about 50, 60 feet over here down on the trail. So I'm, I'm looking, all of a sudden I see movement out of the left corner of my eye. And I turn and I look and down slope, 
is when I saw Bigfoot walk off the pages of myth and legend into reality. I was up the mountain, up the slope behind a natural blind. It couldn't see me. When I saw that, everything I knew about the outdoors, grew up in Oregon, lived in Alaska for 20 years, everything I knew, hiking, camping, fishing, a little bit of hunting, came crashing down. I literally felt my brain crash, reboot, and then I had some real protective instincts kick in. You know, that was my family down there. I ran down through the brush and trees, avoided eye contact because the only thing I knew what to do was in Alaska with the grizzly bear, you don't do the eye contact thing because they'll see it as a challenge. So I avoided the eye contact, hit the trail, ran up to my wife and kids and said, let's go, let's go, move. And they're like, you know, what's your problem? I go, now, move. And they're like, okay. So I move them up the trail a couple hundred yards around a switchback, another hundred yards. I'm not seeing anything, I'm not hearing anything, I'm not smelling anything. I sit the kids down on a log and I give them some water. I pull my wife aside and I said, you're not gonna believe what I saw. And she said, what? And I said, I saw Bigfoot. And she said, I believe you. Immediately after this encounter, Dr. Johnson told his story to a park ranger who had no trouble believing it. But Matthew Johnson's troubling testimony is not the only one to be marked with a seal of credibility. Bob Schmalzbach is a retired Silicon Valley engineer and the former president of the town of Happy Camp's Chamber of Commerce. He's also a Bigfoot guru, having spent seven years examining the possible evidence for its existence in collaboration with the University of Oxford. He operates a website compiling Bigfoot research. All over this place, we have sightings on a, a pretty, not a routine basis. I have seen them using thermal imagers. I've seen them using night vision. I've been with people that saw them that I was, because I'm usually the one taking pictures and whatnot, I wasn't uh, fortunate enough to see them. I've had them photographed, watching me photographing footprints, uh, things like that, but because uh, we always went out in a team and I had my duties and everybody else had theirs. This beach on the other side of Highway 96 is called China Point or China Flat. And it turns out that now that I've been here and got to talk to people here, there have probably been 15 or 20 sightings at this point. If you stop here for a second and just listen, all you can hear is the river. You don't hear cars, you don't hear trains, you don't hear buses, you just hear the river. So uh, it's a unique place. Bob returns to the exact spot where Bigfoot has repeatedly been surprised trying to cross a road. You can see the 25, this is a 25 mile an hour sign. You could see that from where it happened. So between it and that guardrail is where it happened. Whatever it was came up from down there by the river, stepped right over this, took two steps, two or three steps across this hill, and within just a, a 30 seconds, it was to the top of that. Up at the top of that edge, uh, ridge, you see the, all the shorter trees? Those were not there. And that person said they heard rustling up there, they thought it was a deer, looked up there, and this thing was looking up, standing there at the edge, looking down at her. And when it turned to walk away, she could see the soles of its feet, and they were lighter colored. This experience, and seeing this for the first time myself, is why I got started investigating Bigfoot, because before then I thought it was a novelty and kind of interesting, but when I saw the physical evidence that supported the eyewitness reports here, I knew there had to be something more to it, so I went on the road to find out. Bob found footprints on top of this hill, which he believes supports the testimony of eyewitnesses who claim to have seen something that night. After reviewing the hill, 
He considers it highly unlikely that a normal human could ascend so steep a slope. The Bigfoot legend casts a wide shadow over Willow Creek. Fingerprints taken in the region and thought to belong to a beast are so numerous that a special annex was constructed for them in the China Flat Museum. In the Bigfoot room is predominantly casts from, from uh, people that have taken tracks, like Al Hodgson, who's curator here, longtime friend of John Green, who was the er one of the early writers about Bigfoot. And uh, other, other people locally that over the years have had seen casts where they've taken a cast and brought in. And there's also uh, some of the first articles written in the newspapers about having seen tracks, what were they, and that sort of thing. And it, it's just grown from there. Al Hodgson, um, who gave me this cast, he signed the back of it here. He, he's still alive here, just up on the hill. Um, they found these tracks, and they just happened to, to know a fellow named Bob Titmus, who is a taxidermist in uh, Anderson, over by Reading here on Highway 5. Uh, and he had taught Jerry Crew how to make plaster casts. So Jerry Crew uh, is seen in a photo in the Ti Humble Times newspaper holding the track like this, you know. And that really made a big impression on just about everybody. So it hit the AP Newswire, and it went out all across the world. What um, it's important to say is that people just assume that you can make a plywood cut out of a Bigfoot and go around tromping around and make a bunch of footprints that are going to fool somebody. If you have bigger feet on your feet than your actual feet, then that's like snowshoes. Why would people ever have snowshoes? So that they don't sink into the snow. Well, in the same way, if you're going to be a human-sized person with some great big feet, you're not gonna sink in even to fairly soft mud. So if you've got feet like that, a number of things aren't gonna change. Your weight isn't gonna change. Your stride length isn't gonna change. In fact, if anything, it's gonna get shorter because you're so clumsy carrying these clumping things. But just as important, your, the way a plywood foot hits the ground is not the way that a real foot hits the ground. Real feet have toe position changes. When real feet hit the ground, if this is a foot, as they move forward and they made a break right there at the toes, there's a little bit of ridge of dirt pushed back. There's all kinds of dynamic things that happen with a real foot, but not with some plywood thing. Richard Stepp is a professor of physics at the Humboldt University and one of the few scientists who dares to publicly admit that a Bigfoot-like creature could exist. He cites Grover Krantz, the famous anthropologist who died in 2002 and was known for his work on Bigfoot. After analyzing a slew of foot imprints, Krantz believed that some of them were genuine. Some footage captured in 1967 during the filming of a movie by Roger Patterson and Robert Gimlin provides another disturbing piece of Bigfoot evidence. Patterson and Gimlin filmed themselves on the sandbar, you know? Uh, so they had uh, switched, the, when they got to fit Bigfoot on film, the camera roll actually ended, and that's when you see the creature walking away in the distance. It just ends. Unfortunately, they couldn't follow it and get more footage of it. They um, had to go on, he went under a tarp, you know, and switched the camera roll with a new roll of film. You know, a lot of people want to make Bigfoot into like some kind of big, glorious, fascinating, monstrous legend, you know, but uh, if the truth is just a mundane, ordinary thing, uh, that's more valuable to me than some big, tall tale. Were you to walk up the stream here, you'd have to go about 25, 30 miles to get into the heart of the Bluff Creek watershed and the area where the film was shot, the, the famous uh, footprint finds and stuff. People talk about it wherever you go. And the history of it is just everywhere out in the landscape here, if you study it at all, you know. Um, 
I can't help it because people tell me, you know, down at Aikens Creek, they found a footprint a couple of years ago. And so people come in with their photographs of footprints and uh, uh, shadows in the woods that they think are Bigfoot. Many people consider this video captured at Bluff Creek to be definitive proof of the existence of Bigfoot. But the nature of the creature in the video remains an unsolved mystery. The family of one of the filmmakers, Robert Gimlin, tightly controls the film itself. But despite this restriction, the image in the center of the controversy can be found all over the internet. But the image is of extremely low quality. We tried to reduce the blur to better analyze it and perhaps get a sense of what really happened that day. But with the original version of the film unavailable, questions remained unanswered. Well, this is the, um, this is an image, the most famous one from the Patterson-Gimlin film from 1967 up in Bluff Creek. And uh, this was taken from a 50 megabyte uh, scan from a transparency that was taken from the original film. Most people who've seen the film and dismiss it as blurry, grainy, um, don't realize that there is this kind of quality of imagery. Um, if you can see this. Uh, uh, if we could just find that original film or get a published version of this out there, I think it would convince a lot more people. You don't see like zippers and seams and baggy uh, flaps and, and fake fur. You see something that looks like muscles are moving under the skin. Um, you see uh, what appears to be the motion of the hands and the toes and the face and the breasts on the front of the creature. A man named Bob Hieronymus later claimed to have worn a monkey suit for the making of the film. But Patterson and Gimlin have always maintained that the scene filmed in 1967 was genuine. It looks pretty darn realistic. Um, it's, uh, it's still not enough to prove that the creature is real. You know, for every person that believes that that's a real Bigfoot, there will be another who says that just looks like a man in an ape suit. I've had people come into the museum, two gentlemen from who knows where, dressed up in business suits, take one look at the picture of Patterson, which is on our wall in, as you come in the door, and one said to the other one, oh, you can see the face zippered on, and it's a guy in a costume. Well, if you look quickly at Patterson's film, it is a female Bigfoot. It is not a guy in a costume. Even Hollywood said at the time that Patterson filmed in 67, that costume could not have been manufactured. Well, uh, you know, I think the proof would be finding a body of one. Uh, hopefully, you know, not uh, hunted down and killed, but something um, found along the highway, a, a, a piece of a body. Uh, there's these attempts now with genetics to prove it through DNA. Now, some people say that DNA evidence would, would suffice, but really, there's been no DNA evidence uh, of it. Uh, the people have submitted uh, hair fibers and all kinds of different things. Uh, there was recently a study of uh, published uh, online by a veterinarian named Ketchum, who said, uh, you know, we, we have this DNA evidence, and all she actually discovered was that there was genetic material of people, and then there were anomalies. But that anomalies does not prove there's Bigfoot. It just means that she found anomalies. You can find anomalies in all kinds of genetic material. Genetic analyses have been conducted on all kinds of materials attributed to a Bigfoot, but the conclusions usually reveal them to have come from bears or porcupines. Dr. Johnson still spends most of his time devoted to his Bigfoot passion, and to his mind, it has paid off. I put in about 10 years of being a diehard aggressive researcher with all the high tech equipment and never having any visuals or interactions. Well, there was a group of people out there in the Bigfoot world who were suggesting habituation. Popularized by primatologist Jane Goodall, 
Habituation is a method of study that involves acclimating the animals to a human presence. You know, go out and do the Dr. Jane Goodall thing, hanging out with the chimps, right? Well, I did that in this new area. It took them five years before they took food from my gifting bowls. Dr. Johnson claims that this method enabled him to develop a close rapport with the mysterious creatures. Yesterday morning, I knew I was gonna be leaving to come here and, and film, and I had to pack up camp. And so I walked away to where the, from the base camp to where the main bedding area is. And I stood on the flat area above where the main bedding, bedding area goes, it slopes, it's on the slope down the mountainside. And I stood about 70 feet back from the crest of where it slopes down. And I stood there for a good half hour. And I sang some songs, whistled a couple tunes, and just kind of stayed there. And then I heard crack, crunch, crack, crunch, and Daddy walked up the hillside, came over the crest. He stood there. He looked at me. Then he looked down at my little dog on the ground. Then he looked back up at me. And then he turned around and walked back down the mountainside. Whether credible or not, the many hypotheses and theories surrounding Bigfoot raise more questions than they answer. For some, the question to ask is not whether or not the witnesses saw something abnormal, but rather, what did they see? Everybody loves a good myth, and especially myths that are the best myths and the best uh, science fiction is always those stories that are just a half a step away from reality. The ones that are truly outrageous, those are really difficult to truly believe. You can't sink your, your thinking behind that because it's just too outrageous. People uh, love stories and they love to believe in those stories. So I'm just kind of interested in the, in the whole phenomenon, mostly about why people believe what they do. And, uh, and in particular this one, it seems to be so unbelievable to me. Uh, Carl Sagan said extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and there is no evidence, but there are lots of extraordinary claims. You know, the, the nature of human perception is so uh, fluid that uh, you have to question everything that people say. You know, you can't even get a, a straightforward answer about a crime or a car accident. You know, some people will say the guy had a red shirt on, some say he had a green shirt on, and the memory is, is, is not reliable all the time. Nonetheless, I think you can, you can still construct a possible uh, creature out of these, these sightings. Um, you have to be careful not to just be uh, creating your own myth, you know, you're creating your own new legend. You want to be an honest investigator and, and hopefully um, not a deluded uh, myth maker. Myths and science fiction that's only a half a step from reality, it's like, okay, I can kind of get into that. And Bigfoot is the perfect myth. Because, yeah, at one time there were many species of humans running around. And some of them were big and hairy and stood really tall. Gigantopithecus that's been found in Africa, you know, which presumably people think these things are, fits the mold, okay? So it's like, okay, well, this creature did exist in the past on the planet, so maybe they could still be here. And so there is a lot of forest here that has been untouched. And so there's this idea that, well, if it's been unex unexplored, supposedly, <laughs> that could be where Bigfoot is. But the area is not empty of humans. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of miles of logging roads. Uh, the forest here provides a, a continuous source of timber. There's a lot of people that make a, a living working in these mountains, working in these forests, and they're all over the place, and the roads go all over the place, and there's, there's people out there all the time and have been for a very long time. 
Um, I know there's a natural tendency that humans have to see these kinds of forms out in the woods, you know, boogeyman or whatever strange ghostly forms. Uh, we tend to see ourselves out in the woods, especially in the dark when we're scared at night, you know. Uh, that's a common thing that goes back to childhood and the monster under your bed or whatever. Well, Bigfoot is a fun story. It's it's mysterious, and when you're out in the woods and it's dark and the stars are out and you're with your friends around the campfire and you start telling stories, you think, wow, how amazing would it be for there to be this creature out here around us? And people love that. You know, they love the legendary stories. Anyone who works in the woods will always tell you that there are certain times, you know, that the hair on the back of your neck will stand up, uh, that you think you see something out of the corner of your eye. And we're animals ourselves as much as people don't want to admit that. And so um, we have survival skills that are deep inside our psyches. It, it, it helped us survive all of these many hundreds of thousands of years. And so when you move around in the woods, of course, sometimes you're like, what was that? I heard something. Especially if you're not used to working in or living in this environment and you're visiting, uh, you're already off balance. You are already not seeing the things that you're normally used to seeing. And so you don't know what the triggers are to keep yourself safe. And so your, your imagination will be really heightened to, to keep you safe. And so every little clue that happens out there, a snapping twig, a, a a tree branch, you know, moving in the wind. Um, and then, of course, the large animals that we do have living around here, the bears, uh, the elk, the deer, uh, they make sounds. All of that will contribute to the fact that, wow, maybe I saw something. And off your mind goes to the races, you know, and especially with this pervasive myth of this large, hairy animal, you know, stomping around out there, you're, well, maybe that was Bigfoot. <laughs> so my coworkers and I have said, oh, yeah, that was a Bigfoot day. Yeah. Definitely, you know, saw something out there. Like Keith Benson, many people flatly refuse to believe that a half-man, half-ape creature could be lurking in the forests of the region. And the many hoaxes only hurt. There have been a number of people who have uh, created hoaxes that provided so-called evidence for Bigfoot, you know, the, uh, the footsteps in the, in the mud and, uh, and sightings and the, and, and the film of the guy in the monkey suit uh, walking around. It has been proven that some of the footprints were deliberately faked. Wilbur Wallace, the supervisor of the famous Bluff Creek site, fabricated the footprints found here, according to denunciations made by his nephew. His form of tracks that he had um, made with these wooden footprint stompers uh, started to appear. And they have a much different appearance. You know, they're more hourglass shaped and they have strange, uh, awkward appearance. Uh, those started popping up all over the place, and and a lot of these local construction workers and foresters, they like to play jokes on outsiders, you know, uh, anyone out there in the bigger world. Well, it was very funny, I think, for them to, to get them to come all the way from Canada uh, and look at fake footprints. I think one of the aspects of the Bigfoot story is how many hoaxes there have been. And uh, how easily it is to get Bigfoot believers to believe in the hoaxes. Because some of the tracks that you find just look ludicrous, uh, ridiculous. And a lot of them are probably from bears or, you know, they're just strange shapes in the ground. People have said they found prints and um, it's been shown that they're bear prints. They're able to track it back to another animal, test the DNA, find out that it belongs to a different animal, one that we know existing. I mean, the, you find other ones that, I mean, what can you make of them like this? This is claimed to be a juvenile Bigfoot track. Um, a lot of people think, well, Bigfoot is, is so human that uh, when they see f human footprints in the mud, they think, well, this could be a Bigfoot track. And so then you get to the point where you, how do you know the difference at all, right? Any. Anything that humans do could be claimed to be Bigfoot, you know. Uh, it's very problematic, especially when people really want badly to see Bigfoot or to prove Bigfoot. I think it, it, it lends towards the bending of evidence and, 
interpreting things in favor of one's favorite hypothesis. Keith Benson is a wildlife biologist with enormous experience dealing with rare animal species. If Bigfoot really inhabits the forests of Northern California, nobody is better placed than him to discover it. These are presumably really large animals. So they're maybe six, seven, eight feet tall. If you figured out the weight, maybe five, six hundred pounds. Really large animal. They should leave a really large impact on the environment that we can detect where they're feeding, where they're uh, bedding down, where they're, you know, wherever going through their, their daily lives. You know, these things are super duper long lived and they only mate every hundred years or it's really unlikely that they could survive, or we're seeing the very last of them and they're about to go extinct. And then in my own profession, um, there's a number of endangered species that live in this area. And especially with the advent of, of new technology, we are detecting increasingly rare animals pretty easily. Um, even small carnivores that are only you know a foot or two long, only weigh a few pounds, and there's less than 100 of these things and we're able to detect them because we use photo traps and detection uh, gear that allows us to, to find these extremely rare animals. In none of those surveys, of which there have been hundreds in this region, have we ever picked up a Bigfoot sighting in any of our studies. Never, never. And so it's like, if I can, if I can find an animal of which there's only less than 100, they are only a couple feet long, and they exist in this area of thousands of square miles, if I can find them, why can't I find an eight foot tall, 700 pound primate? But despite all of the evidence, all of the proven hoaxes, vast numbers of people continue to believe, fueling the legend. Uh, the more I look into it, the more convinced I become, or at least the more convinced I am that all of the theories of the hoax um, are wrong. And you have to look at it, I think, as a broader picture. Almost everybody in every state in the union has had an episode of one kind or another of Bigfoot. The fellow who claims to be the man in the Bigfoot suit doesn't even know how to describe how to get to that film site, which is, you know, like I said, uh, some 60 miles off into the backwoods on rugged dirt roads. And he, he his description of the area sounds more like six miles off the highway. Uh, it's not. It's not convincing. There was no way that you could absolutely get in there, except like Patterson and Gimlin, who went in on horseback. For others, the Patterson and Gimlin film has serious credibility issues, and no other image of Bigfoot has been captured since the day of that fateful shooting over 50 years ago. In science, it'd be really hard to dispute a single data point. You can't. And all you can do is go, OK, well, you made an observation. Great. Let's go see if we can do that again, and again, and again, and again, and get a solid base of evidence to, to prove the existence uh, of this animal. The ultimate problem with the, the film clip is, again, like I said, we haven't gotten other images in decade after decade of thousands and thousands of people running around out there trying to find more evidence of Bigfoot. While many doubt the existence of Bigfoot, the believers have come to romanticize their faith, associating it with nature and freedom of spirit. Bigfoot kind of represents the end of civilization too, you know, the, the thing that exists outside of it and despite it and can never be found by it, right? So it's kind of appropriate to the Bigfoot legend out here, too. All summer long, there's groups of people going back up in the woods back there looking for Bigfoot. Mostly just totally ordinary people. You would not know them from Adam or Eve or anybody, Joe Sixpack or whatever, you know. 
they're usually married with kids and jobs. And most of these people that come out here on these expeditions, this is like their big adventure. It's a, you know, uh, a vacation. And they want to experience something different. 90% of the people, I would say, come and want to go to Bluff Creek where Patterson filmed. So starting in the beginning of May, when we have sunshine clear through summer, it's a steady procession up to, up to Bluff Creek and to where Patterson filmed, or where they think Patterson filmed. You know, through the years, we had people call up and say, we're coming from Ohio, and how big a bore of a rifle do I need to shoot this thing? How big is it? And uh, so we've had uh, every spectrum. I've had uh, people visit. I had a young man and his wife come on their uh, anniversary from Pennsylvania, where they had saved the money to come. He had a big foot tattoo that went from his knee to the top of his hip, and he had thought about Bigfoot all his life from his youth and could hardly wait to get here and to go out to Bluff Creek and to explore that area and to look for Bigfoot. While the real Bigfoot continues to elude his admirers, his image is everywhere in the village of Willow Creek, from storefronts to park entrances, and he is the reluctant star of annual festivals. Despite his shy nature, it has not prevented him from appearing on all kinds of merchandise. The biggest festival or parade centered around Bigfoot would be the one in Willow Creek. It's Bigfoot Days. It just happened a few weeks ago uh, for this year. And you have people dressing up as Bigfoot, and you have, I mean, half the town is dressed as Bigfoot. Some of the parades will have a dozen Bigfoot marching in the parade, representing casinos and representing businesses, and representing bands. So uh, Bigfoot has been quite a phenomenon in this community. I've uh, twice been the Grand Marshal of Bigfoot Days Parade, so, so I'm certainly a party to enjoying Bigfoot. Bigfoot is a mascot for Willow Creek. If you go to the town, you'll see at least three or four large carved wooden statues of Bigfoot. Uh, there's a couple businesses named after Bigfoot. There's Bigfoot rafting. Uh, there's Bigfoot books, obviously. Uh, there is four, there are four or five big murals in town. I think it's really fun to think that there's some big, hairy, human-like thing running around out there. Uh, I mean, what a wonderful story that is. Um, and that, I know, makes people happy. It gives them joy that there's this mystery out there. Wow, there's this, this extraordinary other species of human wandering around out there. It gives people hope. It gives them happiness. It's a wonderful sense of mystery. Um, that, you know, we haven't conquered every single square inch of the planet. There's still really wild, really weird things out there. All of that helps to propel the myth. Well, because I've been in these woods for a good part of my life, and I hunt, and I fish, and I travel, and, uh, and I, I see all of the animals that are out in these woods. Uh, if, if there were a, a, a Bigfoot, this would be the place for him to be. He certainly could exist and, uh, and live a uh, rather carefree life uh, with, without being inhibited by man, because uh, this is an immense country, and uh, it's a steep, rugged country, and for somebody that wants to hide out, this is the place to do it.